and uh, very pleased to welcome uh, Matt, Matt Disney, who's um, a reader in geography from UCL. And Matt's going to take us back down to the real world of trees and forests, I think. But also we'll be picking up or expanding on, on some of those themes we were talking about earlier, this role of technology. Technology is bringing about a step change in, uh, in, in how we can do our science. I think Matt's going to be talking about the sensor element of it, maybe the platform element of it, maybe the miniaturization, and I'm sure the data management side of things. I probably won't focus on that too much. I'm going to talk about what you, you know, what you can get out of it. I will show those yeah, things. Okay. But, you know, and what we can get out of it, yeah. which is actually what it's all about yeah. at the end of the day. Great. Well, thanks for coming along. Thank okay. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Um, and good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some work that I've been doing over the last few years in using this sort of new technology, uh, laser technology, to measure trees. Um, why it's interesting, why it's throwing up new things, new ways of looking at trees and forests. And it's work I've been doing with the Avinda and, and other groups um, in the tropics and here a bit closer to home uh, as well. I'm going to show you some examples of what we've been doing and how this technology which is you know new in some senses it's not new new um, but using it in new ways is um, is helping us to understand and measure um, forests particularly forests and trees uh, in ways that we haven't been able to do in the past and that there's a kind of circle of being able to measure it like that has thrown up different ways of looking at trees has thrown up different ways of building models and analyzing these data and finding out new things which is the, the really exciting part about it um, it also, I think, you know, there, there's a lot of what we see in these kind of data tend to be rather elegant, often quite beautiful, unusual, um, striking in many ways. Uh, and it does seem to speak to people in, in quite an unusual way. People see trees in a different way. We're all familiar with trees and then we start seeing them in unfamiliar ways and people start saying, oh, I'd never thought about it like that. And so that's thrown up, you know, I, I was just saying to Yadvinda, I had meetings yesterday with two separate people who want to work with these data who are both artists working in very different environments um, one of whom wants to look at visualization of London and how cab drivers see this three-dimensional visualization of a city and the other one who wants to look at people's memories of trees and how that triggers feelings of um, familiarity uh, alienation childhood these kind of memories and is using three-dimensional representations of trees projected onto people as they recount stories of how trees have affected their lives. And they both want to work with these data, which, you know, these aren't scientific applications. It's not my area, but, you know, I'm very happy to, to see the trees being used in this way. So um, I'm going to talk today to the two real parts of applications of using these new laser measurements. One, for estimating the mass of trees. How do you weigh a tree? How do you weigh a forest? Why? Uh, and then how we look at the structure of trees and, and how that tells us about the function and form uh, of why trees are the shape and size they are, how that interacts with their environment. Um, so I've got a few of the kind of um, striking images of the sorts of things that we can collect. So this is um, somewhere that, that might be familiar to many of you. This is Whiteham Woods. Um, so some of you will have even been up the platform that will hove into view any second. So this is a LIDAR data set that we captured from White and Woods a couple of years ago now as part of a, a, an ongoing project. This is a LIDAR point cloud. I'll get to what that is a bit later. So this is a three-dimensional measurement of the, the, the environment. And, but the colors are pixels that have come from a camera that's mounted on the LIDAR. So the color is added by the camera. The three-dimensional element of it is what's captured by the LIDAR. Uh, and again, it's a very striking um, three-dimensional representation it's this is real it's a it's a real measurement of that canopy so it's not a model it's not a cgi simulation you can use it for that but it's not it's a real measurement of this canopy uh, and you know we can start to see the very very detailed structure we could put this on uh, a vr headset and we could navigate through it if we wanted to this is just a, a fly through of it but we could look at it like that if we chose to so biomass then, the mass of a tree. How do I measure a tree and why, what I want to? Um, well, the above ground biomass of a tree tells you how much matter there is, how much mass there is. And of course, that tells you how much of that tree is made up of carbon that it's storing through photosynthesis. Um, so understanding the carbon balance of the world's forests 
comes down to understanding the carbon balance of an individual tree and then scaling that up somehow. Um, how do we measure the biomass of a tree? Um, mostly we don't, and you'll see why that is for very good reason in a minute. Of, you know, the, the, the only real way you can do it is you cut, that, cut it down and weigh it. Uh, and that has all kinds of problems. So mostly we infer the biomass from indirect measurements, measurements of, of height, if we can get height measurements from satellites or aircraft, or from tape measures for measuring the diameter and relating the diameter to the size and mass of the tree um, using allometric relationships. Big things weigh more. Um, and then scaling that up by, you know, however much area of the world is covered by trees of this kind of size and, and type. Um, the issue with all of this, as we see all the way along, is that it's very indirect uh, and there's a lot of uncertainties. It's very hard to un assess those uncertainties. I come from a background of, of you know, of uh, Earth observation, remote sensing using satellite data, where all we ever get to do is indirect stuff. You know, we never get to measure real things. We get to measure photons at the top of the atmosphere, and nobody's interested in photons at the top of the atmosphere. What you really want to know is about, you know, how much forest there is and how land use is changing. And you have to infer all that stuff by making assumptions. That's how you um, measure the biomass of a tree. And that's why you avoid it if at all possible, because it's an absolute nightmare. Um, never mind the fact that once you've cut it down, you've cut it down, that's it, it's gone. Even if you decide that on balance, yes, I'm going to cut down and sample some trees, um, you can see that's a, that's a hard job. That's one tree in the process of attempting to be weighed. So this is one tree that's felled. It's now created a huge gap in the forest and all bits of it everywhere that you've got to try and gather up and weigh somehow in this remote location. Uh, there is a, um, a kind of, you know, a buttressed tree trunk. You can see the size and shape of that tree. It's a, you know, it's a nasty business. I have to measure it. If we can do that uh, um, indirectly uh, and, and accurately, then, and we don't have to cut the tree down, you can see there's a huge advantage to doing that. Um, so the first part of this, the first half, will be about, you know, how do we do terrestrial laser scanning, TLS, for um, getting biomass? Uh, and so we've been across the world, various parts of the tropics, and, you know, Whiteham Woods, it's all very tropical out there these days, um, and how not to do it. Uh, that is the, it, you know, uh, an example of the, the equipment that we're using. It's essentially it's a surveying laser instrument designed for surveying. It wasn't designed for measuring trees. It wasn't designed for ecological applications. These things have been around for 10, 20, well, 20 years or more in one form or another. In this kind of form, you know, the last five years or so, um, they're relatively expensive. That instrument costs around £100,000, so pretty expensive. If you're an oil company or a mining company, not expensive at all. I'll have 50. So they're the customers, they're the clients for these things. They use them for um, assessing um, large areas and mines and geological formations and you know, that kind of application. They don't use them for measuring trees. Uh, that's not a commercial application of this side of things. And a, 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 like a decade or so ago, a bit more, people started to realize that, yeah, there's, there's really interesting measurements you can make with this stuff using kind of surveying techniques and surveying equipment. Um, in ways that they haven't been designed to be used before, um, dragging them through forests and measuring trees for one. Um, you know, weighing that tree, slightly problematic. This is Northern California. Um, that's a fairly large tree, I'd say. Uh, that's an even larger tree. So that's my uh, colleague there, uh, Laura. Uh, and she worked for NASA on a new satellite instrument that they're launching uh, called JEDI. Um, which will be launched in, in a couple of years' time on the space station. And JEDI is aimed at measuring the biomass of tropical forests. There's also a European Space Agency mission using a radar that will be launched about the same time for measuring the biomass of tropical forests. It's, it's a big, uncertain topic. Both of those satellite instruments will do it indirectly, essentially, through inferring the height and density of the trees, the, I mean, the density of coverage, the height of the tree. Um, and then inferring the mass from, from the height and using these allometric relationships. Uh, measuring the diameter of that tree, that's a standard forestry, US Forestry Service diameter tape. It's not big enough for this tree. And that's not even a particularly big redwood in this area. 
So what can TLS do for us then? Here are these, these sort of, this is a point cloud of a tree that you'll see a bit later on. This is a sycamore from White and Woods. Just to bear in mind, it's puny by the standard of the red. It's only 30 metres high. Um, it's got 11 kilometres of branches in it. 11 kilometres of branches in this one tree. This is the kind of measurement that TLS can throw up that we had never really thought about being able to measure before because to measure that manually, Here's a large tropical tree, which I'll come back to again as well. This is a Moabi tree from Gabon, and I'll, I'll come back to this one later. This is a tree that is 50 meters, 45 meters tall. I mean, it's not giant tall-wise, height-wise. It's 60 meters across the crown, though. It's got a huge crown. I'll come back to that later. Um, it's o only got about eight kilometers of branches in it, though. So our little tree from Whiteham, the sycamore, has got you know half as much branch length in it again. A sequoia tree from California, um, you know, a puny 80 meters tall, weighs about 40 tons. I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, so we've been to various places across the tropics, measuring trees in plots that have been established by ecologists and are monitored over time. So the diameters of the trees, the species, um, various other ecological measurements, and been to those trees and, and measured these sort of one hectare plots. So in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in South America, so different parts of the Amazon in, and in Peru. Uh, this is trees from Borneo. Um, this is an example of some trees. This, this is the, the so-called quote unquote tallest tree in the tropics. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some debate about this, but this is actually a photo of, of, the, of Toby's, I think. Uh, is that, is that is one of yours, actually, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So um, there's been debate about where these, these very tall trees are in the tropics, how tall do they go, and um, this was a tree that was found from some airborne LIDAR data, uh, and this tree is 90, 94 metres, so it's by no means the tallest tree in the world, but it is probably one of, if not the tallest tree in the tropics. It doesn't act, I mean, it's tall, you know, don't get me wrong, it's tall, but it doesn't look that tall when you look at the trees around it because of the fact that it's on a slope and there are other very tall trees around it, which is the same problem you have when you go into these redwood groves. You know, you see a tree, you think, oh, that tree's really tall. Uh, and then you sort of, you know, you walk up a hill somewhere and you realise, actually, no, it's not. It's not in the top 10% of the tallest trees that, that are just around it because of the slope and the terrain and the topography. The TLS allows us to see these kind of, uh, uh, of trees from below with these, these very detailed measurements. Uh, this is us working in the, the sequoia groves. It's a really rather pleasant place to work um, with some very old, very tall trees in this area here. Um, a lot of questions about, again, how tall can they grow? What determines the, the possible height? What constrains the height? Is it the mechanical strength? Is it wind? Is it their ability to, to take water from the bottom to the top? So how do we go about turning what we measure with the LIDAR into useful information? So the first thing is we go and measure these plots and we end up with, uh, in a one hectare plot, we end up with about two or three billion points. So what happens, we drag the LIDAR around on the tripod and in each location we scan, it sends out hundreds of thousands of pulses a second, and it builds up a three-dimensional picture over the top of that point where it is. Then we move it around on a grid, so we collect lots and lots of these different views, and then we stitch them all together into one massive point cloud of, of a few billion points. And then uh, that in itself is, you know, it's kind of nice, but it doesn't really tell you very much. It tells you how tall the, the, the canopy is, but those are points. They're not trees. They're not topologically connected in any way. Then uh, we have to extract the trees, so the individual tree point clouds, and that's a tricky job in itself. So my uh, postdoc Andy spent most of his PhD working out how to turn three billion points into 400 trees, each of which has a million points in it. Uh, then once we have those individual trees as point clouds, then we have to turn, that's still just a bunch of points, it's not really a tree, it's just a bunch of unconnected points. Then we have to enclose those points in some form of topologically connected volume so that we can follow branches and we can calculate the volume of that tree, the length of the branches, the size of the branches, so their radii as they, as they scale from larger to smaller through the crown. So that whole process is, is quite a complex one in turning a bunch of very nice looking points 
but into something useful, a tree, a tree that has a volume, it has a branching structure, it has angles, it has, a, it has length of branch. Um, so here's us working in a site in French Guiana, at various different sites here, looking at the contrasting nature of some of the understory here and the, 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 you know, the difficulty of, of getting through this stuff sometimes. That's actually not such a bad plot. There's our grid on which we do our sampling, our idealized grid. And here's our, um, our individual tree point clouds. And here's our cylinder models. Just to note some numbers here. So if we look at the trees that we, that we have uh, volumes here for, the ones that we estimate the mass of is about 600 tonnes estimated from 560 tonnes from the, the LIDAR versus about 460 tonnes using these allometric relationships. So I'll come back to that. These allometric relationships are essentially, let's cut some trees down, let's measure their, before you cut them down, measure their, their diameters, and then we can relate the diameter to the weight of the trees. So these empirical allometric equations are the way we turn simple measurements of diameter or height into the mass of the trees. But of course, that mass depends on how good that empirical allometric relationship is, how many trees you've cut down, and how representative they are of the trees you might come across. Um, so let's look at this process in a bit more... Um, this is a sort of little bit of a side digression, but here's um, a scan that we did um, that featured as part of a documentary, a BBC documentary that was on just before Christmas. This is uh, Judy Dench's back garden. Um, it is, really. Uh, and, you know, there she is just there. No, uh, it is her garden. And that is the oak tree that is in part of her garden. And this documentary was about her and her, um, her love of trees and featuring some of the trees in the garden. They asked us to come and scan the tree and estimate the size and mass and volume of the tree. There's now the tree from that larger point cloud. We've isolated this individual oak tree. Then we've um, stripped the leaves off it. And then we fit our um, cylinder model to it. Now, these are data that we gave to the production company and they went a bit sort of tron on it and turned it into this kind of, that wasn't our color scheme. It was, it was our cylinder model, but it wasn't our color scheme. But this shows you that, that we've, we've turned this, this point cloud into these cylindrical estimates of the, the branching volume and structure of the tree, which allows us to tell that this tree weighs, it's 200 years old, roughly, it weighs about 25 tons. It's got 12 and a half kilometers of branches in it, 12 and a half kilometers. That's a pretty extraordinary number. So one question is, if we want to measure the mass of the tree, and we want to estimate it from the, 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 the terrestrial laser scan, the first thing you've got to do is convince people that this method works. And the only way you can really do it is by cutting the trees down, weighing them, having scanned them first. So this is some work that we've done uh, in that area. This is some work that our colleague uh, Kim Calders who's now at the University of Ghent, led in Australia with some eucalyptus forests. There's the pre-harvest plot. There were, uh, I can't remember, see around 100 trees that were cut down there. That was published a couple of years ago now. But um, the, there's the relationship between the, um, the, uh, the LIDAR and the destructively harvested measure. Um, you know, it, it works. It works pretty well. Um, this was work that was done more recently that came out um, a few months ago by colleagues in Bargainingen who we were working with. Uh, and that was doing that photo I showed you of the, of the tropical forest tree being cut down. This is the paper that shows that. This is the reference tree volume, so the volume from measurements made manually versus the tree volume from LIDAR. Um, it's, it's easier to, to compare volume. Volume is actually a better comparison. It's an easier comparison to do than mass because with mass, you have to worry about water content and the density of the wood and so on. Whereas if you're comparing volume, you're comparing more directly from a measurement you make manually versus the, the terrestrial laser scan. That's the agreement in volume. Um, this is some results uh, um, comparing our terrestrial laser scan data, biomass, versus allometry, allometric relationships. So this is work from a bunch of different tropical sites here uh, across four continents. Uh, is this, we're now up to about 1,500 individual trees here. Um, what's really interesting, we've included all the destructive 
samples that there have been comparing. There's another paper actually that, that's gone into this from a group working in, uh, in Cameroon who've done 60 more trees and cut them down and weighed them and scanned them with TLS. Again, ask where did they get 0.98, we got 0.97. You know, the method of estimating the volume or the biomass of the trees from TLS works really well. Interestingly, though, when we compare it with these, these sort of pan-tropical allometric relationships that are used to, to scale up diameter measurements and satellite measurements across continents, uh, we're, we're seeing at the moment a kind of systematic underestimate of those, of those allometric uh, equations. Uh, and there's partly, this is also shown from the, the paper by um, Gonzalez et al., their destructive sample. They compared, here's the allometric predictions, and here's the, the LIDAR and the destructive harvest predictions. So why is that? So there, there seems to be, uh, uh, you know, somewhat of an underestimate in some of these allometric relationships that are used to scale up across the tropics. You know, in a sense, we have no other way of doing it, so we have to use something. So those relationships are why we, we rely on them. The, the most widely used one is, is published by a colleague of ours, Jerome Sharp, in 2014. That has about 4,000 destructively harvested trees in it that he's collected from various studies that have been done over the last... 30 or 40 years, he's collated together all of those small destructive sample studies and put them together into an allometric equation um, that has 4,000 trees in it. Um, the, one of the key things about it, though, is what we find is that if we look at the size distribution of those trees, we see when we do the TLS measurements in plots, we measure all the trees in a plot. We don't pick and choose. We Essentially, we reconstruct all the trees over about 10 or 15 centimetres in diameter. When you do destructive sampling, by necessity, you have to pick and choose trees. And people tend to pick smaller trees because they're easier. If I'm going to do more trees, they have to be smaller. Cutting down a large tree and weighing it, as I've shown you, is hard work. And so the trees that are in this kind of large bracket here, you know, 70 centimeter diameter and bigger, tend to disappear very quickly, particularly the, the, the sort of taller, broader trees we have a different size distribution in our, in our TLS sample than is in the, the allometric equations. So the allometric equations possibly don't represent those sizes um, accurately. Another issue that, that we come across, and the, the same issue of, of measurement, is that, that wood density. This is why I said comparing volumes is, is a good way to do it, whereas comparing masses, you have, to in, you have to assume some value for the density of the wood that you put into your volume. So the value that you put in there, then of course critically affects the mass that you end up with. For comparing volume, you don't have to worry about that. Whereas if you compare mass, then you have to worry about which value of wood density you've used. Wood density varies a lot. Here's our white and sycamore again. Um, some work that we've done recently showing that if we use the standard UK allometric equations to estimate the biomass of this patch of white, it comes out somewhere 200, 220 tons per hectare. Uh, our TLS is saying 450 tons per hectare. There's a lot of uncertainty there. There's, there's a big difference between 220 and 450. It's 100% different. Um, so we're just trying to work out why. That's partly possibly due to the form of the allometric equations that are being used, the assumptions about wood density that are being used. It could be that we're getting it wrong as well. So we're looking at how this, this is, is, um, is going to pan out. But it's, it's, it's a very interesting issue that, that we're seeing this more generally. Um, so I, it was one of those things when, when we did the redwoods. So I calculated the volume of this redwood. Fine. Uh, then I was thinking, OK, this is a sequoia. Sequoia sempervirens is coastal sequoia. It's commercially very valuable, you know, obviously there's a lot of protected areas, not so much logging, but it's been heavily logged in the past. So forestry people and logging people will know about the wood density of it, because the wood density says something about what you can use it for, how useful is it for different building materials, how commercially valuable it is. So you'd expect the wood density value, I would naively, expect it to be well known. You look in the literature and there's values from 0.32 to 0.52. So you plug one value in, you get a completely different answer for the biomass of the redwoods of Northern California than if you plug that in. Which one do I use? Um, 
however way you look at it, the, uh, the biomass of these, these redwood areas is extraordinary. It's the, the, it's the largest, densest carbon store in a natural environment anywhere in the world other than probably the peatlands of the, of the Congo Basin that have recently been found, according to a colleague of mine, uh, Simon Lewis. So th they have carbon stores about that. You know, tropical forest is 700 to 1,200. And these redwoods are, well, 3,000 to 5,000, depending on which wood density value you use. There's a lot of variation. And that's because wood density does vary a lot. It varies within a tree. It varies radially. It varies with height. It varies with age, the type of mechanical properties of the tree. So um, these are allometric equations, uh, you know, they, they also depend on the form of the tree. So they make some assumptions that trees are sort of generally tapered cylinders, which, of course, on the whole, they sort of are. But of course, very often they're not. And then we measure the diameter of the tree and we infer its mass from, you know, an equivalently sized tapered cylinder averaging out over a bunch of trees that have been measured. Lots of trees don't have um, solid centers. They have holes in them. They have irregularities. This is a, a plane tree in Kew Gardens. It's one of the, in fact, the oldest tree in Kew. Uh, it's an oriental plane tree. It's the tree that m most of the plane trees in London were propagated from, interestingly. Um, it looks quite healthy. It's completely hollow. There's hardly anything left of it uh, from about that point upward. This is a, a, um, a sonic tomograph measurement through the tree, and the blue bits are basically empty space. So that tree is, you know, it's still quite healthy and growing, but it's probably not as structurally sound as it once was, and so that's why they're concerned about it. So moving on to the kind of the other side of this, the sort of things that we can measure. So the three-dimensional structure of the trees that we get, we get the volume and we can talk about the biomass and the impact on carbon studies and so on. That's really, really important to be able to do this in a new way. But of course, we're getting so much other information about the trees, the size and shape and structure of the trees that we haven't been able to do before on large scales. And what I mean by that is lots of trees, thousands of trees of all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. That's something we've just been starting to do in terms of understanding tree form and function. These things are intimately related, the shape and size of trees. Why do they grow the shape they do? Why do they grow the size they do? What constrains these things? Um, this is some work that has just started to come out of this. So the structural difference between and, and uh, uh, within sites. So this is some work comparing some of our tropical data, just the, the branching angles. Uh, these are tropical sites. And then interestingly, here's um, Whiteham, and here's a plantation grown conifer. So as you'd hope, they are dramatically different. If they weren't, you sort of think, well, I'm not sure about this. Um, but the, the question is, is, how different are they? And can we tell the difference more subtly? This is the species difference within Whiteham, so dividing it now within a, the temperate, deciduous, you know, UK woodland. Um, are these different or not? You know, there, there are some differences. <coughs> what are those differences? Um, I'll, I'll skip over that bit. But so it's providing opportunities, and this was just something that I sort of I finish on from from my perspective before leading into the sort of things that that Yadvinda has been thinking about a, a lot, and that we've all been thinking that we can deal with with, with TLS. Um, we see these amazing structural properties of, of the canopy. We're looking at the canopy in a different way. This is looking up through the canopy at, at Whiteham. The different colours here are the different cylinders that have been pulled out in our cylinder model. It doesn't really matter. The thing is, we see the structure of these trees looking up as if you were a mouse on the floor of the forest, looking at the gaps in the canopy. And we see these gaps here, these gaps in between the crowns. Those are not there by accident. This is this, this, um, this property, this observed property called crown shyness. That, you know, there's no point in two trees getting right in amongst each other in terms of crowns because you're competing for the same light resources. So it's a waste of time. So there's this natural propensity to, to keep a little bit separated, um, essentially you know, working out, you know, this is my bit, that's your bit. Um, so that you know, has been widely known and observed, but we can quantify this in different ways here. Um, 
one of the things that we see when we look at this is what I've always thought this is when I look at these kind of tree size and shapes, I think, oh, it looks like a brain. People often say that, oh, it looks like a brain, it looks like a kind of neuron structure. You know, I don't know much about that sort of thing, but that's one of the things that I look at when I look at these data. This occurred to other people, and we got in touch with a, um, a group who are working on the structure of neurons in the brain. They've scanned, they've built three-dimensional structure of neurons, and they have a database of this stuff, and they're applying machine learning methods to try and classify neurons into types. And they were asking the question, can we distinguish neuron shapes, function, form, structure, from other natural structures, structures that carry information, structures that carry resources? of which a tree is one. So we're now at the moment sort of applying their same machine learning methods to our trees to see if there are similarities, which here's a neuron, here's one of our trees, and at some, uh, here's the tree of life in organized in the same way using this kind of graph theory approach. And what you see is if you look at the first few branching orders here, there's actually quite a lot of similarity in terms of the, the tree and the neuron, even though they're, they're, they're fulfilling rather different roles. They are networks, transport networks in some respects, but very different constraints. Which then leads me on to this more general structure. So trees have a very wide variety of shapes and forms, and I'll, and I'll show you something at the end that kind of highlights that. So we see trees that are very plastic in shape. You know, you can see an oak tree and it can take all sorts of different forms. And then there are other trees that have much more rigid forms of kind of conifer shapes. Um, so what determines these things? What determines these, these standard properties? Um, it's all these, these um, a community of trees is not just the functions of an in individual tree. It's how that tree grows in its wider environment. These are things that ecologists have been thinking about for decades. And this is an interesting this is the sort of standard textbook, literally the textbook form of tropical trees look like this. They are follow these broad general forms. Uh, they're one of these kind of forms. But these were essentially based on visual observations and sketching and experience. Hard to quantify because it's very hard to measure. You walk through a tropical forest, you, you don't see the tops of the trees. You can hardly see above the, the understory at times. So being able to sort of quantify those things is very, very difficult, unless you can get above the canopy, which is something that, um, this is, is this Halle, Yedvinda? No, it no, it's something similar. So, so the, uh, Francis Halle, who, was a, um, who is a, a, a French, a classic French ecologist, tropical ecologist, he sort of proposed these various forms of tropical trees and said they, they fall into these categories. And he was interested in getting above the canopy and built these kind of dirigible airships to, to get above the canopy in order to sample them, which is a, you know, one way to do it, but still very difficult to measure the structure of those things. So here is a, um, that's the view we get from, from the top. We get to look down at it from a satellite and when, then we have to infer what this tree is how big it is, how old it is. That's the problem with the satellite view of things. And yet, there's all this, there's all this going on underneath. So we can infer something about the tree, even from its height. You know, it tells us it's a tall tree. A tall tree will generally be heavier than a, than a short tree. But within that, there are these huge range of variations of crown size and shape. This is a LIDAR point cloud of, a, of an individual tree. So a tree then is, is this you know, optimization problem. How do I get resources? What do I do with those resources? So um, I've got various different constraints. That can be light, it can be temperature, it can be water, it can be nutrients, uh, it can be all of those things interacting together. It will be a space, competition, you know, history, environmental, evolutionary, all of those things. Um, mechanical strength, so gravity, wind, snow, those things are going to impose huge limits on, you know, why do conifers look the way they do, you know, in, ter in terms of shape, snow. Um, shading, competition, um, reproduction, pollination, seed dispersal, you know, you, how are you going to do that in amongst all these other constraints? If you don't do that, then, you know, everything else is, is, is not worth doing. Um, so all of those questions, there, there's been this interest in, in um, tree shape and form, what controls these things? You know, how can you say something about the evolutionary and competition environmental history of a tree? How will it change? How plastic is that? Um, 
So it's either tended to focus on, on uh, tree development or idealized trees. Yeah, conifers are good because they're easy to work with. They have these sort of fairly rigid shapes and branching structures. You get to tropical trees, it's not the same. And, but even temperate, temperate deciduous trees seem to have even more variety and have even more plasticity, this incredible range of shapes. The lack of data, quantitative measurement. So in amongst all that, um, some various people have been throwing sort of hand grenades into this subject uh, through the proposal of um, these kind of um, general model for the origin of allometric scaling laws in biology. You know, when you, you publish papers like that, you know that um, you, you're going to cause a fair amount of debate, shall we say, you know, proposing general laws in ecology. It's a very admirable aim. We want to provide very general laws that will allow us to explain why trees are the shape and size they are based on fundamental physical principles that no one can argue with. Um, Inevitably, there is a lot of debate about these things. Uh, so there's been pioneering work by Jeffrey West and colleagues, Brian Enquist and uh, Brown, James Brown, uh, and various others, but they kind of led the way in this of bringing a kind of physical view of things, trying to simplify and find phys simple physical laws that will explain a lot of what we see about tree form structure. Um, if they're true and if they're if they they're right, then they're very powerful laws that allow us to explain some of these constraints. Why do trees grow the height and shape they do? The, the, the limitation here as well, and where a lot of the controversy has arisen, is because there's been so little data with which to test these hypotheses. You've made some very big claims, some very powerful, and then the data sets to test these against are very very small because. The kind of predictions and models that they are, are proposing, as we'll see, rely on detailed structural measurements, the size of the branches, and in particular, how those branch sizes scale <coughs> to a tree. That's one of the fundamental underpinning aspects of these theories. So these theories are basically attempt to explain how the metabolism, how the function of the tree is explained largely by its form, so its architecture modeling these as essentially fractal resource distribution networks, a series of increasingly small pipes that get water from the bottom to the top and get light and then the, the photosynth photosynthate from the top to the bottom and distributing everything in between. Um, a, a simple process with a very simple kind of architectural underpinning of the radius, uh, 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 of the, the radius scaling of the branches that's why it's attractive in many respects. This kind of simple fractal scaling approach is very elegant, very elegant, and it allows you to explain a lot about what you might see in terms of resource distribution, this optimization problem. So here is a, a kind of idealized uh, pipe theory of, of, a, of a tree. Here's a, a parent unit with a radius and a length, and then a daughter, and then a second daughter, and so on, Child, child branching or out through that tree. Um, that is how the kind of uh, metabolic scaling theory approaches modeling a tree with, a, with some detail we'll see in a minute. Um, does that describe this tree? Uh, in one sense, yes, it does. And of course, in, in, in other ways, no, it doesn't. And that's where the debate comes in about where this works, where it doesn't work, where it's applicable, how far it allows you to extend this to explain the form and function of trees. If you can't measure the form the, of the trees, then how are you going to test these kind of hypotheses? Um, so resource distribution. So this is work led by Lisa Bentley, who was um, a PhD student of Brian Enquist and, and uh, worked on this stuff. She's one of the only people I know, really, who's done the, the sort of quantitative work of cutting down trees and measuring the kind of things that you need to measure in order to test these metabolic scaling theories, um, which goes to show, you know, she published a paper, I think it's this paper, um, where there were 20 trees in it, uh, 12 of which were essentially kind of little Christmas trees, you know, and then greenhouse grown. That was by far the most trees that had ever been measured like this in one paper. And that basically made up about half the trees that had ever been measured like this at all in terms of being able to test these kind of scaling relationships. Um, so that work was looking at the, the model predictions and measuring these, these levels of, of branching, the size, uh, the radius and length distributions in this hierarchical way through these trees. Um, 
the, re the really attractive thing about these theories is that you can relate the um, the, the branch sizes, the, 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 um, the mass and the volume of the trees here with these scaling exponents, essentially to the respiration and the photosynthesis of the tree. So at one end, we've got the, um, the metabolic functions of the tree down through this chain of, of, of proportionality to the mass and volume of the tree. So the mass and volume of the tree are related to its function through these the important parts of these exponents here which are geometrical terms explaining the the branch size and distribution in the tree so the point is if you can measure those branch size distributions on large numbers of trees over large areas you can finally start to test these sort of things more quantitatively um, so this is work uh, done by um, another colleague of ours, Alvaro Lau in um, Wageningen, who's doing a kind of PhD measuring these kind of, he did some of the, some of the destructive sampling work that we saw in, in Guyana and Peru. Um, so this is actually the Tambapata plot here. Here's some of those trees here. There's the point clouds. Uh, these are profiles through those trees. Um, so this sort of process is let's do some laser scanning and generate some models. Uh, we've got some architecture. We can work out the branch radius and branch length. Then we can work out these scaling exponents and these the radius and length scaling exponents, which gives us this relationship to the tree metabolism as proposed by the kind of West Brown Enquist metabolic scaling laws. Um, and we can compare those theoretical values with what we see. So here's some preliminary work that, that Alvaro has been doing. Here's distribution. This is what the, uh, the, the, the theory says that the radius scaling exponent ought to be, the length scaling exponent. And here are the, di the distributions uh, from three different uh, tropical forest plots. So again, this is preliminary work, but this is the first time really that, that we've tested these sort of metabolic scaling laws, theories, uh, using quantitative measurements in this way, other than on just a very small number of trees. And it's throwing up some really interesting questions already. You know, I think you know, that, that we all knew that, there, that these, these, these ideas for these metabolic scaling theories are really elegant, really interesting, and throw up some interesting predictions. The great thing about them, right or wrong, the fact that you can test them and you can falsify and you can they make predictions so that you can go and test those predictions mean that they're hugely valuable in terms of understanding whether these rules apply or not they've been a testable prediction um, surface area this is work uh, Ali where's Ali oh, it's just there <laughs> so um, this is work that, that Ali has been doing and this is related to this same process of um, there are parts of these theories are um, describing how metabolism is related to the, the total surface area because of course the radius and the length of the, the branches is encapsulated in the surface area so the woody surface area of the tree is proportional to these these metabolic um, uh, functions and so this is is work that, that is that Ali's been doing looking at taking our lidar data and comparing it with the theoretical predictions and, and showing there's some big differences which is again also very interesting and again we're still at early days with that yet but nobody's done this before seed dispersal so reproduction strategy uh, there's another tiny little tropical tree here um, this is the the, the moabi tree and uh, the gabonese one that you saw uh, early on um, this is one that um, i showed you before this is the lidar measurement of, of that that tree which has these huge um, seeds, very large seeds, which are um, primarily elephant dispersed. Is primarily elephants, Yadavinda? Yeah. yeah, okay, so the, you know, what the reproduction strategy there is you've got to be big and tall and you've got to spread out wide to drop those seeds fairly far away from, from your, your sort of parent tree and then making enough noise and disturbance that elephants can detect those and come and pick them up and eat them and disperse them more widely. That's different to a wind dispersal mechanism. Um, so here's our 43 meter tall, 65 meter across Gabonese uh, Moabi tree. Um, here is a different 
reproduction strategy. So wind dispersal, um, dropping seeds and having them blown away. Um, so in that case, if you're going to survive and be um, uh, successful, being really tall, which is a risk in a lot of ways, because you have to devote an awful lot of resources to that, and then you put yourself at risk of wind and all sorts of other things. So being tall, being taller than the other trees around you is a risk in one sense, but if your wind dispersal is your reproductive strategy, then good for you, that's what you need to do. Uh, and we compare that with the sort of shape of the crown there, of our much shorter but wider tree. To tree mechanics, so this is, this is work that Toby Jackson's been leading, is, is using these, these 3D measurements and models to plug into um, models of the, the wind stresses, so stress and strain models, a kind of engineering type approach the sort of thing that you do with an aircraft in, in CAD, computer-aided design, is generate these um, very, very detailed three-dimensional models and subject them to air flows. Um, then you can work out what the stresses and strains are on the thing that you're interested in. And there's been very, very little work done on this in terms of trees, again, because nobody's been able to generate real trees like this. You can come up with sort of idealized tree models, but actually having real data is a, is a new way to look at this. So applying those kind of engineering design approaches, so fluid dynamics, computational fluid dynamics models, to understand the stresses on trees. Um, so can we start to answer questions about wind limitation on height and shape and you know, how trees organize themselves in, in, in groups responding to um, the environment? So wind causes mechanical stress. We know that. Um, you know, we just have to look around after a storm, and you see the, the wind damage even here when we don't have such tall trees. Um, poorly understood in the tropics, um, varying between continental, coastal. They're going to vary on the scale of local topography. You know, a, a small valley versus the top of a ridge. The wind exposure is dramatically different. So the critical speed at which trees break. You know, what is that? So that's something that, that Toby's been doing in his PhD, is putting accelerometers on trees and looking at how they move, and then using our TLS data to explore the stresses and strains on those trees. Um, you know, that's work that's been using tropical uh, trees now as well for the first time. Uh, resonance. So there's some theories that suggest that um, trees have different modes of resonance, essentially to act as a protective mechanism against uh, wind stresses. Um, so dissipating wind energy, and we're showing that, um, that, 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 that you can now start to explore those theories. Again, they were very, I would say, data-free in the past, simply because there hadn't been the structural information to be able to kind of test these things. And again, I, this is the first work that I've seen using this kind of modeling approach. Um, so large-scale frequency analysis, looking at those kind of frequencies, what are the resonant frequencies of, of trees across a large number of tropical areas? Can you distinguish between one and another? So to finish off then, well, so TLS is really helping us to do a number of different things in sort of ecological work in understanding trees and forests. So it's helping us to measure the properties of trees, the biomass, the size, the shape, and that's helping us to address questions about why the size and shape. New insights into how trees, the size and shape is related to the environment, related to the function, varies across different spaces and places. Why do trees look different in Africa and South America? What, what are the controls on these things? Um, I just sort of finish off then with a, with a picture here. This is one actually I, I knocked up this morning from a tree. This is another tree in Kew. Uh, this is what they call a uh, chestnut-leaved oak. So uh, it's, I've not come across this species. It's an oak tree, but the leaves look just like a chestnut, hence the name. Um, but I thought, no, they don't. No, they really do. They look just like a chestnut tree. If you didn't know it was an oak tree and you looked at the leaves, you'd think it was a chestnut. It's weird. Um, but this is a tree that they that is one of the tallest trees in Kew. You know, okay, it's 37 meters tall. It's not tall by you know other standards. Um, but we measured this because it's one of their champion trees. It's the tallest tree of this species in Britain. Uh, and they've got all kinds of interesting information on plaques around there about the history of the tree and the species and blah, blah, blah. And Tony Kirkham, who's the head of the Arboretum there, wanted us to measure it and scan it. 
And so we were just pulling out the information on this uh, about you know, the branch length. So if you remember, the so sycamore tree in Whiteham, 11 kilometers. The Moabi tree is eight kilometers. Judy Dench's oak tree was our champion thus far at 12 and a half kilometers. <coughs> well, what's your guess on this one? 15 points. 16, any advance on 16? You were saying you're going up or you're going up, so you know, higher, lower, higher, lower. Higher than 24, any advance on 24? Over 30. Whoa. We, we don't know for sure yet, we need to kind of, but it's anywhere between 31 and 35 kilometers of branches. I mean, that just is pretty staggering. 30 kilometers of branches in this one tree. Uh, you know, in, in the one sense, you sort of think, well, so what? What, what, what does it mean? Uh, and I, I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's just that those sort of numbers, it, but that's the, those sort of numbers haven't really been pulled out before. The interesting thing is, you know, what, is the he what the hell is the point of having 35 kilometers of branches? Where's that going to get you as a tree? Why? Why? Because it, at some point, you are filling up space and you're competing with yourself for resources. You're competing with yourself for light. You've got, to, you've got to maintain that stuff. It also provides a risk. So one thing I notice, if you look in here, there's a big gap in the middle. There was another big trunk element there, but because it was a, a wind risk, they cut that bit out, they pollarded it. So actually, there was a lot more than that, but two or three years ago, they, they chopped that out. So 40, 45 kilometers of branches, where does it stop? What's the constraint on that? So that was a question I was just asking to Yad Vinder, is that, you know, we've measured some of the tallest trees in the tropics. We've measured some of the tallest trees in the world, the, these sequoias. Some of the heaviest trees, this 100 ton Moabi, 100 and something, 110 ton. Is that tree the biggest tree in the world in terms of branch length? And if not, where is that tree? Because I bet it won't be a giant, it won't, certainly won't be a giant tropical tree, it certainly won't be a redwood, they, they, they just don't have that level of branching. It might be some quite anonymous oak tree in a forest in Eastern Europe that's 35 metres high and just huge and been left there for 350 years and just filled in this space and doesn't really have any other constraints on its growth so it can afford to do that. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Mm, great stuff. Thanks so much. DIY yeah. scientific kit. How much does this cost to do? Are those LIDAR set up still 100 grand? Or? So that, that's the kind of h very high end. Yeah. Um, and as I say, that, that from our perspective, that's a lot of money. If you're an oil company, mining company, it's nothing. Um, the prices are coming down. And um, as the access to the equipment um, improves in terms of the number of instruments out there, doing the sort of ecological side of things. Just in general, LIDAR of this kind of technology is changing fairly rapidly because of the advent of UAVs and autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. So autonomous driving cars, yeah. um, you know, is driving LIDAR. They, they, that's, how, that's how they work. They have little LIDARs all over them and they're capturing three-dimensional information in real time, processing it very fast to, to build the environment around you. That, of course, is driving innovation in LiDAR technology from small, low-cost, fairly small range LiDARs that have a range of 50 meters and cost $100. At some point, there's going to be, a, there's going to be a, a kind of overlap where those instruments, that those prices are going to get good enough that we can start to use them. I mean, they already are. People are using those sorts of things for these kind of ecological applications. It's not the same kind of thing that we can use for doing this, but in, I would say very soon, the idea that you'll be dragging a LiDAR out on a tripod that costs 100 grand to do those kind of measurements will be, you know, either you do it on a UAV or you'll do it with a, you know, just walking through with a handheld or a backpack or, you know, an autonomous vehicle or somewhere in between and the cost will come down and the availability of data will go up. Mm. So, um, and what sort of applications might you expect with that? So they haven't got the range, basically. So to say. start with, no. So they haven't got the range, but of course you can you can collect measurements very rapidly without having to. The great thing about them is that you can collect measurements very rapidly without having to do careful post-processing yeah. co-registration. 
So essentially, you can just drive through and collect data. That's what they're designed to do. So they, they have a, a, an onboard inertial navigation unit, and they, they know where they are. And so they're essentially building the point cloud as they go. Um, that technology is improving very rapidly. And when that happens, you know, the first thing is you'll be able to, already we're starting to be able to do surveying. So one of the things we have to do is we have to have targets out so that when we move the scan location from one place to the next, we have to be able to register those things very accurately to within a few millimeters from one to the next. And that, you know, that slows things down. It slows things down in the post-processing. If you could take away the targets and just literally put it on the tripod scan, put it on the tripod scan, you, you would re reduce the time it takes to do that by an order of magnitude. If you didn't have to have it on a tripod and keep it still, and you could just have it in a backpack and wander through, another magnitude, of, you know, what about that next bit then in the workflow that you talked about the processing? Mm -hmm. I think you sort of said something, I don't know, three billion points or whatever, which mm -hmm. had to create into these models and make sense of it. Yeah. Does that take massive computing power? Or again, is that going to be something which, you know, we can do all that stuff <coughs> linked up to the cloud? Uh, what's what's, what's the, massive computing power though? Well, this is what I'm asking. I mean, is it, yeah. is it something which needs institutional computers, such as you have in universities? Or is it in, increasingly something which you could do you know, basically using cloud computing. We're, we're sort of in, in, in the, at the moment, we're sort of in the middle in the sense that um, that processing that Andy Burt, my postdoc, developed, you can do it for a few trees uh, just on your laptop, yeah. you know, in the space of an hour. Um, if you want to extract 400 trees from a 3 billion point cloud and you want to do it reliably on your laptop, it will take four weeks. Mm -hmm. But if you if you then got four laptops, it'll take you a week, and if you've got forty, it'll take you an afternoon. And so that's kind of where we're at at the moment. But and that's changing pretty rapidly as the, the tools develop. My last question on this three, I've got three. I know you only only have two. But for, for students like here, if you want to skill up in these techniques, what are you looking at in terms of time? Is, is this something which you can skill up to do? You know, to do go from Knowing how to do your LIDAR, the modeling, visualizations. Is this something which is going to take three years in a PhD? No. Or is this something you could skill up in three no, months? No, it, it, it would have done three, four, five years ago because there were no tools really available, yeah. or the tools that there were were rather basic. Now, the, there are already tools out there for doing a fair amount of this stuff. Collecting LIDAR data is, is actually pretty easy, and lots of people are doing it for all sorts of different applications. There are much cheaper lidars than this. There are, you know, there are lidars that cost a thousand dollars and ten thousand, you know, and then a hundred thousand um, with different properties. But lots of people are collecting lidar from airborne, from, you know, vehicles. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of point clouds out there, uh, and so there are tools available in, you know, so if people use Python or R or MATLAB. There are already modules out there that handle lidar data, lidar that comes from handheld or this or aircraft LIDAR, um, which I haven't really touched on at all. There are already tools out there for starting to do this. There are, you know, point and click interfaces to some of this stuff. The more subtle the information, the more technical the information you want to pull, pull out of it, the more you're going to have to immerse yourself in dealing with three dimensional data. It's not hard to start, not at all. And there are lots of tools to do it. This is certainly more and more encouraging to me. Not only is it fascinating, it sounds like we can have it's to easy. Into this. <laughs> <laughs> Just study it. Yeah. Cedric. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> question is you mentioned a paper where uh, someone measured changing trees. Yes. Uh, That's Lisa Bentley, yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing you said actually was being used to sort of compare or validate the number of trees you were measuring. So, my question being, uh, and you also mentioned that these three trees are something like half of those that have been measured before. So if that's the case, what, what methods are being used to validate this physically, the, the results that you get? So in, in the past, um, none. So, you know, essentially, so the measurements that Lisa did, so she's measuring the branch length and the radius of uh, at different orders through the tree, these sort of fractal scaling exponents. Um, there have been very few measurements that have done like that, and, and particularly on anything other than small trees. Um, and the question is, is why would you bother doing that if there's no, if, if you couldn't measure it any other way? So now we're doing it with the LIDAR. Of course, the question arises, as you, you know, rightly ask, 
okay, so you're doing it with a LIDAR, you claim you can do this, now validate it. So of course, that's the, the next stage of this is we need to go and measure those size distributions for larger trees that we've done it with the LIDAR. So that's something I'm working on a project with, with Yadvinda right now and, and Ali as well, is explicitly looking at that, is looking at larger trees and looking at these branch size distributions in order to do it from the LIDAR and to do it using the old fashioned cutting stuff up and tape measure way to see how well we get it. And not only that though, is to measure the physiology of the, the trees, the metabolic part of it, to measure the metabolic function of the trees so that you've got all three components. You've got the metabolism, you've got the structure from the theory, and then you've got the structure from the LIDAR, and then you've got the manual measurements, and you can compare all of those things to start to, to test those things really properly. So if you if you re if you really if you really got the time and, and inclination to do it, so the, the best effort I've seen at this by an absolute mile. So there's a guy called Dave McFarlane um, who's based in Michigan who does uh, he specialises in destructive sampling of trees, essentially for the allometric stuff to understand the allometric. So we did an experiment recently in in Harvard, as as Will says, where there were th there's a bunch of trees, but basically there's three of them that we measured in fine detail with the LIDAR. And then he and his team went and made 10,000 measurements of each tree in a destructive sense. So they went on a cherry picker to the top and in 10 centimeter voxels, they took everything in each 10 centimeter voxel and physically cut it and measured it. So these weren't massive trees. They were 20 meters tall and they weighed about seven tons. But, you know, he literally dissected those trees into match wood and measured every single one of those matches so that's how you do it for real but that's a nightmare um you know so i'm glad dave's doing it and he's going to do it for some douglas fir trees in yosemite this summer and hopefully we'll get out there to measure those trees as well but we're not measuring the, the physiology of those trees i just thought it's just amazing what goes on in our science it's, so <laughs> it's humans involved we're doing amazing things yeah. it's not the reason i asked it i don't know about the public engagement Artists. Yeah. So I've seen some research with an artist collaborating in the museum of political research and in terms of climate visualization, but not so much in the ecology. Uh, is it kind of people like Edward Wilson talking about VR tourism as kind of a way to preserve uh, protected areas? How far do you see kind of collaborating with artists to keep you going? And I guess it would never sort of be a primary focus. Very much so. I think, in it, I think it's increasingly, from what I have experienced so far, it's becoming increasingly important. So that thing there, the future starts here, that's an exhibition that's opening in May at the Victoria and Albert Museum, where they saw some of my LIDAR data from um, Brazil. And the exhibition is about how we're measuring and interacting with the world. It's a major new exhibition that's opening, and they wanted to use the LIDAR visualization, the one like I showed you of white and right at the beginning, so the three-dimensional with the photography overlaid on top of it, in order to illustrate this point of, of, of what does being in a rainforest look like. So that, that's exactly that kind of thing, is in this case from a museum exhibition point of view. Um, I'm also talking to um, somebody who's, who's um, curating an exhibition for the um, natural, the American Museum of Natural History in New New, uh, new York, where they're opening a, they're building and opening a new wing that will be about virtual reality and visualizing the environment, and it'll have this huge immersive space, and they want data sets to put in that space, a so real science data sets, and they're going to hopefully they're going to put one of my data sets in there. Um, the Judy Dent thing actually was interesting because they didn't tell us this. That they said, oh, yeah, you know, they took the data and they produced this nice stuff and it was this lovely documentary and it was great, really nice. Um, and then when they, they had the premiere of it at the, the cinema exhibition space in Kew and Judy Dent was there and we, that we looked at the data and they interviewed us all, the people involved, um, they had done a really nice VR mock-up with our data, and I say mock-up, a VR film that you can put your headset on and you can navigate through the tree. 
So that's actually available on Facebook. If you look on the BBC Arts Facebook page, there is this VR version of Judy Dench's tree as narrated by her, and you could just view it through Facebook as a, as a sort of rotating thing, or if you've got a VR headset, you could put it on and you, you know, Google Cardboard and put your phone in it, and you can actually view it. So very easily now, we can take our data. So Sketchfab is a good example. So Sketchfab is, is a tool that's used for visualizing uh, 3D data. People use it for um, all kinds of you know, computer simulation models and so on and doing 3D art and stuff. And you can actually just, um, as I say there, if you've got a, a VR um, mo uh, headset, you can just put it on and you can view my you can view my tree in, in VR straight away. And we didn't develop that tool or anything. That's just there and people have been using it. And we were like, hey, that's cool. We can just put our trees on there, put a headset on. So we've been wandering around in the lab with Google Card and mobile phones. Going, oh, look at this, this is incredible. You know, it's amazing. We've just been so really blown away by it. You know, it, it, it lends itself to that very, very well. And we're using that with schools, with students who are coming and showing them 3D data, showing them a forest, what a tree looks like in a, in a canopy. So yeah, I think that's what I was saying right at the start. It seems to sort of speak to people in a very fundamental way about, hey, look, I can interact with a tree in a way that I've, you know, trees and forests and a natural environment in ways that I've never been able to do before. And, you know, that um, it's the only, t you know, my kids know what I do and they're like, yeah, whatever, dad. Um, <laughs> this is the only time I've ever been able to make them go, whoa you know so for me that's a result because then i put the headset on them and i show them this and suddenly they're like oh okay i get it now yeah it's, it's video gaming it's environment it's immersive they understand that very well better than i do uh, and so that was the only thing that could impress them you know <laughs> so, so on that theme of gaming and uh so there's this, this, this idea that uh so for instance some of things like hunting games are really mm -hmm. popular in the, in the nature yeah games, and they're using simulated environments but Almost with these ones, you, you could have that. You could go into the some real related. environment, and could you blend in then the true hunting data? Because then actually you can go and replicate classic we've hunting had, days, or you know. We've had people already um, wanting to use some of our data for uh, game and film yeah. environments. You know, uh, we had someone contact us about um, Gabon. Oh, we're setting a film, and we've got a whole lot of CGI stuff in Gabon. We saw your data. Can we use it? And they, you know, there there are people already out there doing that and, and capturing environments very on very large scales, very quickly and very realistically is absolutely it's happening right now. So as an example, there's a colleague of mine in, in UCL who's been doing some work on rendering realistic environments for gaming and he put it this way that the last version of um grand theft auto grand theft auto 7 cost 300 million dollars to make it's hollywood budget right a hundred million of that was spent on making background environments that people are just driving through uh, yeah. so, so that was a whole teams and teams of artists working in 3d yeah. rendering stuff that you just drive past yeah um it took a billion, $1.1 billion the first weekend of opening in advanced sales. So yeah. it, you know, they're already going, yeah. You're, you're saying this could create that. Yeah, and so they're already it's looking, there. so they're the sort yeah. of budgets and people who go, okay, if this is gonna work for us, we're gonna invest massively in developing this technology going from sort of fairly small scale, you know, even the oil and mining industry, Regal, who are the biggest seller of LIDARs, airborne, ground-based, you know, they, they probably sell up few hundred to a thousand or so of those tripod mounted lidars mm -hmm. you know it's a lot of money but you know if you sell ten thousand of them it's a different or a hundred thousand it's a different game altogether somebody told me that this is already actually happening so when you see cars in films now it's not actually a real car it's the computer simulation they used to build the car and design it which they now just bring into yeah i mean so you, it's, it's all going on already and the, the lidar coupled with very very high processing and high resolution photography i mean you know there's there's a whole other area that i haven't been mentioned at all that, that you can get three-dimensional information from photography that you can use to complement the lidar data and people are doing that very much so with you know you can buy an off-the-shelf 300 quid drone and, and get three-dimensional information at the top of a forest canopy well look, we've covered a lot of ground it's getting time to uh, 
wrap things up, but I think we have sort of just gone now into the future of all of this, there's a sort of application. Any last question or are we good on that? Okay, yeah. Um, are there any potential risks to having this much information about forests? Um, we haven't thought this through very well, but... No, we've touched on this a lot, actually. If, yeah. if logging companies have this information, can we get this? Yeah, for the value we get it. But th this information is isn't is hard to come by, and they don't need it. You know, they can go through a, a forest and go. There's some trees that are likely for logging. If, if it's illegal logging that we're worried about, I I don't think this is really going to help because it takes it's much harder for us to get in there and do than it, than it is for them to go in and, and send somebody in and go. Yeah, let's just drill a road through there and chop that lot down. Um, on the other hand, you know, what I would, I'd say the counter to that is that if we're able to show what's there in very fine detail, to say to people, look, this is what it is, this is how much carbon there is, this is what the ecological value of this is in a different way, perhaps the value we're attaching to those things and leaving them in the place that they are, will, will it be increased? There are, I mean, there are concerns of things when we work in, um, in, in places like in the Northern California, we were working with a group there who said, look, when we go here, you don't tell people because some of these, the, the groves of the very largest, the tallest trees in the world are kept pretty quiet because they don't want, it's not that people are going to chop them down, it's just that people are going to traipse a path through these, these parkland areas to very wild areas and you know that there'll be people wanting to come and see them understandably but they, they you know that they want to study them because they're essentially unique environments unique trees that once they're damaged they're three thousand two and a half thousand years old and the environments that they're in have you know pristine well, that's just the wrong word but they're, they're very undisturbed comparatively so you don't want people going there and going hey look we measured this great tree it's just over here you know right, one quick last one here and then i've just got one the rapid one okay. Alongside a lot, I would say, yeah. So we're, you know, we're already working. I'm working with a couple of different groups looking at um, things like uh, bats. So I've already started to work just in lo close to home in London, in the uh, Olympic Park. Since the whole regeneration of the Olympic Park, there's work going on there with a colleague of mine at UCL, um, Kate Jones, who has built this kind of bat monitoring network there, and she has these acoustic bat sensors where they're using machine learning <coughs> to measure the, the very, very finely the frequency of the bat calls. They can identify individuals through their calls. Um, but what they want to know is how does the environment that they're, that they're living in and flying in affect where they're feeding, what they're feeding on, at what times. And so they want a detailed three-dimensional map that they can put bats in. Um, and then I, there's another colleague in, in uh, the States who's she's doing her research in acoustic monitoring. So acoustic monitoring of species biodiversity in forests, you know, recording the, the diversity of sounds and trying to decompose it. There's some really, really interesting work going on. But one of the things that you need to sort of, you need to extract from that is that's the soundscape of the forest. But what's the, the structure of it? Because you need to sort of subtract it from or map it onto that before you can say what's coming from where. So there's a, there's a lot. So just one last one to, to wrap up. So we've been thinking quite a lot about uh, not only the future of science, but maybe also the sort of a bit about how the structure of science or the organisation of science is going to happen. So there's this rise of analytical companies going mm -hmm. on at the moment out there. It seems to be quite a lot of this, once you've developed it, could move out into that commercial analytical realm. So for instance, in that question where Kate has asked you to do it as a fellow academic, it might be in the future that we just ask the questions and then get an analytical company in to do it. Do you think this might happen, that we might see a lot of these techniques going out into the like the private sector? I, I can I, imagine all the ecological consultants are starting to want these services. You know. Yeah, there are people offering those services already mm -hmm. from LIDAR survey. You know, I should make LIDAR has been used in, in forestry stuff for a long time for to, to augment uh, traditional forestry measures, height, basal area, merchantable timber volume, those sorts of commercial 
things where people have been yeah. going out and doing, you know, it's not going to replace it, but it's it's augmenting it. And, and, and so people are spending a lot of money on doing aerial LIDAR surveys, augmenting that with now you can you can put a, 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 a LIDAR with a similar capability, not quite, but a similar capability, the one we've got, on a fixed wing or a rotary drone. Um, and so you can go and fly larger areas. Um, you can't do it in quite the precision, but, you know, and so there are companies already offering those services. Mm -hmm. at, with, just at the dawn of that, really. Yeah. But it's yeah, it's it's, it's happening because you do, you don't want to be an expert in flying UAVs and mm. processing lidar data. You know, I don't necessarily want to do it. It's kind of interesting sometimes, but yeah. sometimes you just want the, the thing, the data. And like, yeah. yeah, it's great. Great. Well, what a great lecture. What a great discussion. Thanks so much, Matt, for coming up. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>